Perhaps one of the things wrong with Nova Scotia is that people don't care. People must cease to worry about bread in order to begin to enjoy their problems. We should build our own houses. We don't know how to build houses. People we can learn, though. Live dangerously and pray furiously. On the surface, My Play Tompkinsville is the story of the first cooperative housing project in North America. But in its spirit, it is the story of how a group of Cape Breton miners, inspired and prodded by Father Jimmy Tompkins, managed to stand up to the coal company, build their own houses, and in the process they became, as Father Moses Cody would say, masters of their own destiny. The people can do ten times what they think they can. Over time, the charismatic Father Moses Cody became the face of the Antigonish movement. Cody and Tompkins were the catalysts, but when you dig deeper, you realize there were many others who were important to the development of this movement. And now is the champion X-Men on the court. And the crowd is delighted when as a very athlete, coach and teacher of yesteryear, makes an unexpected appearance. Here we meet one of the great men of St. of X, one who pioneered in scientific farming and cooperative marketing, one of St. of X's first great adult educators. I am the niece of Dr. Hugh McPherson, who was down at the university at the time of Dr. Jimmy Tompkins and Dr. Cody. Dr. Hugh McPherson was involved with agriculture and he really was one of the uh, great promoters of organic farming that you hear so much about today. Dr. Hugh McPherson was one of the first to extend the work of the university to rural people. Little Doc Huey, as they called him, taught science and engineering, as well as piano, violin, German, French, Latin, and Gaelic. He also coached hockey and rugby. All along, he worked closely with farmers, eventually becoming the first representative of the Department of Agriculture. He also started the 4-H movement in Nova Scotia. But Dr. Hume immediately started work with them, and he was doing his regular teaching at the university and parish work on weekends, but also uh, doing this work with the farmers. He'd go out and he'd test the soil of the farm, and he could tell them just exactly what they should be trying to grow. He is the first man to organize a cooperative, to sell wool that was grown. I took soil chemistry from Dr. Hugh when I was in the novitiate, and I took Greek from Dr. Jimmy Tompkins. Both he and my uncle, Dr. Hugh, believed that the ordinary men and women the ordinary men and women, the farmers and the fishermen, had really good intelligence. And when they were trained to use that intelligence through a good education, they could fend for themselves. Another person is A.B. MacDonald. Terrific organization skills. It's great to have ideas. But as Tompkins used to say, ideas have to have hands and feet. And ideas that have hands and feet mean that you have really have to know organization. You have to get things done. Cody would go in and give an inspiring talk in a community. And he could do that. And he could give a talk that wasn't entirely realistic in some ways. But the people would just get buoyed up by his approach to things. What's wrong with us? Has the blood of our ancestors frozen within our veins? Are we so terrified by men like ourselves that we do crouch and cower at the feet of the men we have made our masters? Cody gives a speech, but after the speech, the people have to be organized. The study clubs have to have information going back and forth. All these things have to happen. There are so many things, and A.B. McDonald was absolutely brilliant. He was a protege of Tompkins. A.B. McDonald, before the meeting, had organized, made sure the people got out to the meeting, and then he stayed behind and made sure the study club started to form. And then after that, once the study clubs were formed, then in came the most brilliant thing the Anakin Ish movement did, is they hired a bunch of women who were brilliant in what they did. 
They did all of the development work that needed to keep these study clubs going. Thousands and thousands of study clubs, the study plans, the newspapers, the things that the study clubs needed to do to become educated were all done by a group of women which included two nuns, very young nuns, Sister Marie Michael and Sister Irene Doyle, both just around 20, graduates of the university. We had a good staff of women in the extension department. And Dr. Cody used to say that he had the smartest women in the world working for him. He appreciated everything that was done. And Sister Marie Michael and I worked with the women's study clubs. I wrote a lot of stuff for the extension. The title was, What Can the Women Do? And there was different chapters of different things that the women could be doing. And that was kind of... Then I did another one, The Fat of the Land, which was on uh, growing your own food and processing it yourself. And it was uh, to, to get people to do things for themselves and to show them that they had resources at hand. You know, They were creative people. They were ever seeing possibilities. Kay Desjardins. Uh, Kay Thompson, the Cedar Cameron, uh, Cedar O'Hearn from New Brunswick. Joining them were uh, Ida Delaney and Pat Sears. And these women in the anti kanish movement did a great deal of the behind the scenes work in actually making sure that materials were available for people to use in the development of the credit unions, etc., etc. We are at the North Bay Fishermen's Co-op at Cribbins Point, one of hundreds of co-ops in the Maritimes. These co-ops were set up by local fishermen under the guidance and leadership of Father Moses Cody and the Extension Department. Four generations of the McDougall family have fished for lobster here at St. George's Bay. J.R. McDougall now helps his son carry on the tradition. It's where my grandfather fished back in the early 1900s. My father fished here, I fished here, and... Uh, JR's father was an active member of the North Bay Fishermen's Co-op and the local credit union, where he was involved with what is now called microcredit. My uh, father ran the local community credit union out of our home. He was the treasurer for the Lakeville Credit Union, which uh, serviced the communities of Lakeville and Morristown, and uh, I can recall Particularly early in the spring, uh, fishermen showing up, getting uh, small loans, when they're getting their boats ready for the uh, spring, spring uh, fishery, some minor repairs. And uh, then if the season was kind of successful, uh, they'd be back uh, not only paying the loan off, but uh, making uh, deposits, uh, saving for the future. When you used to go lobster fishing, you used to go out with the oars and the wind. When people start saying, okay, what can we do? The first question after what can we do, it seems that what we need is we need money. And how do you get money if you had no money? Well, they used to say 25 cents a week. Then at the end of the week, what you have is you have 10 people, 10 times a quarter, you have $2.50. At the end of 10 weeks, you have $25. $20 would buy you $5 left over and then you could work on the next guy's engine. This is what the credit union was all about. Spawn, it, it's interesting that today many of these people like who used to come for these loans, now today some of their children and grandchildren are on these waters fishing. They now operate enterprises that are probably worth, some of them actually if they have a crab license along with the lobster license, are worth uh, upwards of a million dollars. It's hard to believe now, but in 1930, an inshore fisherman's average income was just $75 a year. $75. So, with the formation of the Extension Department, Father Moses Cody used kitchen meetings and study clubs to help inshore fishermen set up local cooperatives. Cody founded an umbrella organization called the United Maritime Fishermen's Union a union of fisheries co-ops. Before very long, all along the shores of New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia, there were thousands of study clubs and hundreds of co-ops and credit unions. What is the difference between a credit union and a bank? Banks are for profit. 
and shareholder profit. Credit unions are for members. Member-owned, member-driven. The community linkages, very, very important factor, the community linkages. Uh, and the social concept, the ethos of the credit union system is alive and well. We were born and started out of necessities in the, in the late 20s, early 30s. The self-help initiative uh, that they started with the anti Kanish movement uh, is what made the difference and that's why we are where we are today, 74 years on in Nova Scotia. The idea of cooperative banking was started in Germany in 1864 and soon spread to Italy, France and around the world. Inspired by what he saw in Europe, in 1900, Alphonse Desjardins and his wife co-founded the first People's Bank in North America, Les Caisses Populaires Desjardins in La Ville, Quebec. In 1908, Desjardins went to Boston to meet with Edward Filene of Filene's department store. Filene was in the process of initiating the credit union movement in the United States. We are here at the credit union in Antigonish, called the Bergengren Credit Union. It was named after Roy Bergengren, who worked with Edward Filene in Massachusetts to help establish credit unions all across the USA. Father Tompkins persuaded him to come here to help establish local credit unions. Bergengren recommended that we should have legislation for credit unions in Nova Scotia. He was persuaded to stay and helped draft this legislation. After that, credit unions sprang up throughout the maritime provinces, especially in many of the smaller communities that the regular banks wouldn't find profitable enough. <laughs> 